Welcome to our training today. So we're going to be talking about Dun and Bradstreet's business credit scores today. By the end of this training, you're going to know how these scores work. You're going to know how to control them. And that's going to help you get the most money for your business at the best terms. It's kind of like an open book test, way easier to take if you know the formulas that be, that are being used to determine your risk. And that's what we're going to be diving into today. I'm going to teach you exactly how lenders, credit issuers, suppliers use these scores to make all kinds of decisions about you and what you can do to make sure that those decisions are favorable towards you, meaning you're getting approval versus denied. You're getting low interest rates, you're getting long terms. It all comes down to commercial credit scores. So let's dive in and let's check this out. So Dun & Bradstreet is the largest credit reporting agency, period, not consumer or commercial. They are the largest in existence. They've been around since I think 1841. Okay. They also are, they house something called a Dun's number. And the Dun's number is a worldwide identification number used to identify your business. So think of it like this. Your EIN number is used by the IRS to recognize your business as a legitimate entity here in the United States. The DUNS number is what's used worldwide to recognize your business uh, as a legitimate entity. So for example, you if you want to become a contractor for the United Nations, they look at your DUNS number. The Australian government, the United States government, a lot of governments and a lot of trade associations all use this DUNS number uh, to be able to basically identify your business. And you can learn more at dnb.com forward slash Duns dash number. Now the Duns number is completely free with Dun & Bradstreet. And the reason I start today with this is that you can't even get Dun & Bradstreet credit profiles or credit scores without a Duns number. There's two things you must have to get any score with DMV. You need to have a Duns number is the first. And the second thing is, is you need to have three accounts reporting to Dun & Bradstreet. So get the Duns number. It's completely free. If they get you on the phone and try to sell you something, you don't need to buy what they're selling. Okay, it's completely free to get your Duns number. And if you don't want to get sold, don't get on the phone with them. Okay, and Dell says, what's up from Facebook? Thanks for tuning in. And Liddell from LinkedIn. Hey, buddy, thanks for coming in. Just so you guys know, Liddell is the first person ever to comment in a live stream from LinkedIn. We just started going live yesterday on LinkedIn. So we're now live on Periscope, LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube. So Liddell, thanks for coming in. So DMB reports. Well, DMB generates their own reports. And again, this helps clients decide whether the business is a good credit risk. So think of it like this. If a supplier is going to work with you, if a lender is going to lend you money, if a credit issuer is going to give you a credit card or a line of credit, if uh, an insurance company is going to give you insurance. All of them are looking at your Dun & Bradstreet credit reports and scores to determine should you be given those things, money, insurance, et cetera, and what kind of terms should you pay? Uh, do you pay your bills on time? How high of a risk are you? So companies then use these reports to make informed business credit score decisions uh, and basically avoid bad debt. And a lot of factors go into these reports. But let's never forget the credit bureaus purpose is to sell data. They gather information and they sell information. That's what they do. Okay. So in this case, they're gathering all this information. They're using all these scores to determine your risk. And then other companies such as suppliers, lenders, credit issuers are using these scores to determine how high of a risk you may actually be. So in general, when DMB does not have all the data they need, then they basically indicate that on the reports we're going to talk about today, because here's what's interesting about your business credit scores. You can control them just by deciding how much information you want to give the reporting agencies. You can give them some information or choose not to. And depending on what you give them and what they do and don't have determines what kind of risk categories you go into with some of these scores. Like I said in the beginning, I'm going to teach you how to control your scores today based on knowing what to give them, what they have, what they look at, how your scores are determined based on the information that they actually possess to be able to determine those scores. Okay, so in some cases, they might even put that it's unknown or other cases, they specifically categorize how they're making their decision based on the information that they have. Now, DMB constantly is gathering information. It works to improve these scores, approve the analysis of these scores uh, and make them as accurate as possible. That's how they get their reputation, okay? That's actually why you can't add utilities to a Dun & Bradstreet credit report. They've never found an accurate way to get information from utility companies that they trust enough for the information to be accurate. Credit reporting agencies must have accuracy 
or their information is not going to be wanted by the companies that use them like lenders and credit issuers. So getting this information to be accurate is extremely important. So for example, even giving DMB your current financial statements is something you could do that actually controls uh, the outcome of some of your scores. And we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. And uh, Saman coming in from uh, YouTube as well. De and Patrice, thanks for tuning in. Dell from Facebook, can you repeat the Duns website again? It, you can just go to creditsuite.com forward slash Duns. If you go to creditsuite.com forward slash Duns, D-U-N-S, you'll get to that exact same link because the actual link's a little bit longer. Uh, and Asia says, I have vendors but can't get a Paydex score to save my life. I'll keep trying. I'm going to teach you today what's causing that problem and how to fix it. Good morning, family. Bismarck says hello. And Ladell says, keep sharing your wisdom, Tyler, to everything he says. Thanks. And Emmanuel coming in from LinkedIn too. So we got a lot of people tuning in from LinkedIn today. Glad we went live yesterday on LinkedIn and we were approved to go live. So DMB has five main credit scores, very different than the consumer world, right? We're used to TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian only giving us one score, but here's a secret. They actually have a lot of scores. In the consumer world, just so you know, there's actually a lot of scores that you have, but they're called scorecards. And last time I checked, I'm not a consumer guru as much as I am on the commercial side. There's 16 different scorecards. So in the consumer world, you have these scorecards that are used by certain industries. So for example, if you apply for a mortgage, they use a mortgage industry option scorecard. If you apply for a car, they use an auto industry option scorecard. And the mortgage scorecard weighs mortgage history heavier than anything else. The auto scorecard weighs auto history heavier than everything else. So even though you may think you have one score with Equifax, TransUnion, and Experian as a consumer, the reality is there's a lot of scorecards that are happening behind the scenes that you don't know that are used for industries. Same thing in the business world. People are familiar with Paydex, Dun & Bradstreet's main credit score, but it's only one of the five main scores they have. Okay, the other four are their DMB rating, the delinquency predictor, the financial stress score, and the supplier evaluation risk rating. Now, here's why this is so important for you today. In the commercial space, we have Dun and Bradstreet, Equifax, and Experian. But DMB, Equifax, and Experian all have very similar scores this way. Delinquency predictor, they all have. Financial stress score, they all have. Supplier rating, they all have. So they all have variations and call these different, but just by learning these five today, you're going to get a pretty good idea of the other scores that Equifax and Experian use as well. And you can go to products.dandb.com to actually grab a sample business information report. You might want to take a screenshot of this. Okay. So then that way you can actually go get a sample of what comes on a DMB report. Now you don't have to pay DMB. They're 150 bucks a month. You can go to creditsuite.com forward slash monitoring. And that'll give you $24 a month credit monitoring with DMB, Equifax, and Experian, the cheapest on the planet. So that way you can see your reports without spending that $150 if you want to save some money there as well. So as we talked about, the main credit score is DMB. However, a business will not get a Paydex score unless you have three trades and a Duns number reporting. So we just heard that right now. Asia said, I have vendors but can't get a Paydex score to save my life. I'll keep trying. It's not a matter of keeping to try. Keeping trying, Asia. There's two things you need. You've got to get that Duns number set up and you can go to creditsuite.com forward slash reports and do a free search with DMB to see if they know you exist and if you have your Duns number. It costs you no money to figure that out. Okay. And once you have that Duns number, you have to have three accounts that are verified that are definitely reporting to DMB. So if you have the Duns number and you don't have a Paydex score, no credit reports created with DMB, it's because you do not have one of these two. If you have both, you will have a credit report. You will have a Paydex score. If you only have one, you will not have a parole report and you will not have a Paydex score. So a lot of people get credit with vendors that report to DMB, but then they say, well, DMB won't give me a credit profile. Well, it's because those vendors have not yet reported that credit to DMB. And a lot of things can cause that. You didn't spend enough money with them for them to report the account. They might report the account quarterly versus monthly. But just know that these two things are necessary. If you ever don't have a profile or score and you're trying to get one with DMB, it's because you don't have one of these two things. And if you get both, you will have a score, just so you know. And Jennifer says, good morning from Panama City, Florida. You're just up north. Love all the videos. Thanks, Jennifer, for tuning in uh, from YouTube. I appreciate that. So this is DMB's dollar-weighted numerical rating of how a company has paid its bills over the last year. A lot you're going to learn right now in this sentence. So let's dissect this. Dollar-weighted means this. 
What dollar weighted means is it means that if you have two credit cards, one has a limit of 10,000 and one has a limit of 1,000. DMB gives more weight into the score for the higher limit account. So a thousand dollar credit limit, ten thousand dollar credit limit. If I ever had to go late on one of the two, I would always go late on the thousand dollar limit account because the ten thousand dollar account has more weight into my overall paydex score. So again, dollar weighted means that your higher dollar amount to trade lines count more into your score than your lower dollar rating. Okay. Also, you need to know how it's paid its bills over the last year. DNB has multiple scores, but two categories for these scores. One is based on performance or past performance. How you paid your bills over the last year is called a performance score. It's strictly calculated based on how you performed paying your bills. They also have another type of score called a predictive score. And the predictive score, as you'll learn, takes into account many things to predict what may happen. So in this case, this is a performance-based score that is dollar weighted. Okay, so this is based on trade experiences reporting to DB. Bottom line, people that report payments to DMB, they actually take those payment experiences and those trade, trade or payment experiences are what are used to strictly calculate your DUNS number. Another very important point. All that is used to calculate your paydex score, the most popular score in the business world, is how you pay your bills to people that report to DMB. So for you and I to get you good scores, we need to get accounts, three or more, that report to DMB, and we need to make sure you're paying those bills on time or early. If we do that, we will have a good paydex score because it's the only factor that's used to calculate paydex, how the people that report to DMB report how you've paid your bills, on time, early, how early, how late. The score ranges from zero basically to 100, with 100 being the best score that you can actually get. And remember, it's reflecting how your business pays its bills, not you as a consumer and how you pay. And again, as I mentioned, larger bills have more weight into the calculation. That's why they call it a weighted score. So we've also next got the DMB rating. Now, Dun & Bradstreet bases the rating on a company's net worth based on financial statements as well as the company's overall condition. There's a reason I'm stressing things like net worth and financial statements because this is a score that you can choose whether you want to give them your tax returns and your financials or not. That's your choice. You can either do it or you can not do it. But if you give them your financials and you have a good net worth or they show positively and reflect positively on your company, well, then it's going to get you a better DMB rating. So if your financial statements are not provided, the score is based on company size, industry, and other related factors. I'm about to tell you one of the best kept secrets in credit scoring that you need to know because it still blows my mind, blows my mind that it's calculated this way. But what DMB does is this. They first look to see if they have your financial statements. And if they have your financial statements, they determine what your DMB rating is. You can send DMB your tax returns if you want to. That's your choice. You can do it or not. If they don't have them because you didn't supply the financial statements and they can't get them, then they come in and look at your company size and industry to determine how uh, what your rating is, Okay, what your actual financial stability is. This is where it's very important. When you file annual reports with your secretary of state, you tell your secretary of state how many employees you have. So DMB will get that information and they will use that to determine your rating. Meaning, this still blows my mind and I think it's crazy, but it's very, I need to be very clear. DMB doesn't have your financials. They will hold it against you when you have a smaller amount of employees. So when you're a newer business, you e automatically are going to get dinged on your rating because they see short, smaller a number of employees as higher risk. And then if you compound that with being in a higher risk industry, then you really get a low DMB rating. This is why I say all the time, you need to choose your own NAICS code. Never let people report what they think your NAICS or industry classification code is to DMB because if you let them do that, DMB can categorize you as high risk based on an industry you're not even really in. 
And then on top of that, if you have a shorter number or smaller number of employees, you really get dinged on this DMB rating. So lessons to learn here. If your financials are good, get into DMB. Be conscious of how many employees you put on your employee account with your secretary of state because it's used to calculate this with all three credit reporting agencies will punish you in their scores when you have a smaller number of employees and always make sure that you can go to a place like neicscode.com, choose your own NEICS code because higher risk industry codes that they think that you're in will be held against you. Now, again, if you, if you don't provide the information to DMB, then again, they're going to come in and they're going to look at those other factors and you'll be yet a lower rating if no information is provided because what they're looking at is those three things. Do they know your industry? Do they know the number of employees you have? Do they have your financial statements? And they categorize you based on those things. Now, Asia says, I have DMB. I need to research the vendors reporting. Yes, you do. That's why you're not have that paydex. You don't have three accounts with them. Uh, and what's a paydex score? We just talked about what the paydex score is. If you came in late, I'll pull up the slide real quick. You might want to go back. But again, it's a score that basically looks at how you've paid your bills um, over the last 12 months. And it ranks you from basically zero to 100. That's what your DMB paydex score is. Uh, and Chanel's talking to Asia. And Scott says, may we get the presentation by email? If you uh, are a partner with us, you already have access to this presentation. And we don't actually give the slide decks out. Um, if you're not a partner and that's just because that's what our partners pay for, like our partners pay to have all these assets that I'm actually go over and anybody that's a partner with us offering business credit financing as a service, um, then actually has access to these PowerPoints and they use it to do training and get customers on their own as well. If you want to learn more, give us a ring 877-600-2487 our numbers on the bottom of these slides. So delinquency predictor ranges from one to a hundred higher scores are better. However, predictive scoring only represents a statistical probability. See that word predictive scoring. So delinquency predictor is predictive score. Uh, DMB rating is a predictive score because it's predicting things, not looking at past performance. So paydex score, performance score, completely based on how you've performed in the past. DMB rating and now delinquency predictor are predicting how you may act in the future. So these are predictive scores. Okay, so it's not a guarantee. The scoring system ranks and orders accounts based on probability of late payments. However, a new company has no historical information by definition. Very, very important here. You cannot get money for a business successfully if you do not build your business credit. You just can't do it. You're going to get money. You're not going to like the interest rates. You're not going to like the terms. You're not going to like the payments. And here's why. Because new companies don't have enough information for people and lenders and credit issuers to look at to determine the rates and terms you'll be given. You're automatically looked at as very high risk when there's no information on your credit report. As a matter of fact, DMB, as I mentioned, won't even create a credit report for you unless you have three accounts reporting. Experian and Equifax are even worse. They will create a credit report for you and give you a failing score automatically just because you have no credit reporting. They'll even say on the credit report, your score's low because we don't have any active trade lines. There's nothing for us to go off of. So we're automatically deeming you as high risk because you're new. You don't have a lot of employees. We might not like your industry code. And on top of that, you don't even have any credit history for us to look at. That's why you have to establish business credit or you're going to be dinged and held as high risk even when you're not. The delinquency predictor looks at the portion of slow payments in recent months, the portion of past due balances to total amount owing, higher risk industry based on delinquency rates for this industry, and an increase in proportion of delinquent accounts and recent payment experiences and evidence of lawsuits. A lot of things to dive in here. First of all, lawsuits show up on your commercial credit report. We're not used to this on the consumer side. They absolutely do on the commercial side. If you are getting sued, if you are suing somebody else, that will show in the public record section of your commercial credit report. And evidence of open lawsuits can hurt your delinquency predictors. So you know, no, they show up and how they're calculated into your score. Okay. You're also seeing, again, high risk industry based on delinquency rates for this industry. This is why it's very important. You need to learn your own NEICS code. And let me actually, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to go off script here and I'm going to show you exactly what I mean and exactly why this is important because it, it keeps coming up on all of these slides. So let me show you NAICS code search. Okay. So I'm at NAICS 
Dot-com. Okay, it's free to be able to do a search here. I don't know if it's going to let me do it. I don't know what's going on here. Uh, and I'm going to show you exactly what I mean. So when you apply for a credit card, apply for a loan, and they ask, what industry are you in? You may say something like, I'm a consultant. I'm in education, right? We just blow it off and we just throw something off, off the cuff. Well, here's the problem. The problem is, is that when you do this, the lender or credit issuer will guess what industry that you're in. They will assign an NAICS code for you since you're not being specific. Now, if you're a lender and you're going to give somebody an NAICS code, and, and by, by the way, an NAICS code is an industry classification code the IRS gives you. The IRS really created this because they want to make sure the expenses you claim on your tax returns are normal for your industry. That's the secret they don't want you to know, but that's why these things exist. Lenders use them to see if you're in a high risk industry or you're not. So you need to know exactly what your NEICS code is, or you'll apply for a loan and tell them I'm in finance, right? Very common. I'm in financial services. That's what I'm in. That's what you tell them. Well, now here's the real deal. If I say I'm in finance, as you see here, well, finance is a category and there's a lot of subcategories. Look at all the subcategories in finance. You see what I'm saying? So if you told them you're in finance, then they now have to choose between all of these options. Now, what do you think the probability is they're going to choose right? As a lender, they're going to choose automatically something that's higher risk because they don't know and they're going to protect their downside. So by categorizing you in a high risk industry, it helps protect them. And it's your fault because you weren't specific on your NEICS code. So what you need to do, for example, is not say you're in finance. You need to find out exactly where you are here. Let's say you're a securities broker. Let's say you're real estate. Let's say you're in consumer lending. And then on your application, every time you apply for a loan or credit card in the future, you need to say, I am in consumer lending NAICS 522291. Every single application for credit and financing should be exactly the same way. When I go to set up in my bank and they say, what industry are you in? I say, I'm in consumer lending. My NAICS code is 522291. It's like you're a prisoner. Like, here is my code. You need to know it backwards and forward. You need to use it on your IRS tax returns. You need to use it when you apply for a loan or a credit card. If you do not do this, then what will happen is they will automatically put multiple NAICS codes on your credit report. And as you're seeing now, if we tie it all together, if any of those codes are indicating a high risk industry, then it's held against you. That is the problem. So you've got to make sure that you know your NAICS code. You always use the right one to avoid this. Otherwise, they're basing your risk against other people in your industry and you might not even be in the right the industry that they're putting you in. That's why this stuff is so extremely important. Okay, It is exactly why this is important. So now we look at a financial stress percentile. Now, teach you one more lesson about how all these scores work. Okay, I'm not trying to overwhelm you, but if you know these points about predictive score versus performance, and if you understand percentiles, then you'll understand how all of these scores work. A financial stress percentile means they are comparing you against other people in your industry to see where you rank percentage wise against them. So our, if, you, if your risk is X and other people in your industry is Y, well, are you in the top 10% of risk in your industry or the bottom 10% of risk in your industry? You see what the problem is if they don't have the right industry? These type of percentiles are all wrong because they're gauging you against other people in your industry, but that's not even your real industry. They put you in that industry because somebody had to guess what your NEICS code really is. So one is most likely to fail. A hundred percentile is least likely to fail. It's a comparison to other businesses in your industry. Anytime you hear any score in the commercial world listed as a percentile, it is comparing you against other people in your industry. So it's based on how high, how much higher raw score, the financial stress score is from 1001 to, 1001 to 1875. Okay, so let's talk about this. So if we talk about the financial stress score, 
Then it ranges from 1,001 to 1875. No reason for us to remember that. Okay, a score of 1,001 represents the highest probability of failure, higher risk, and the lowest, and a figure of one, uh, lowest probability. So the bottom line is the higher the score, the lower the risk we are. So when we look at the financial stress percentile, they're looking at your financial stress score. They're comparing it to others in your industry. And then they're saying, yeah, this is in the top 5% of risk or the lowest 5% of risk. So what they're ultimately doing is taking this score and comparing it to other people in your industry. Now, the financial stress score is based on a low portion of satisfactory payment experiences to total payment experiences. Bottom line, how many a payment experience is the reporting of an account to the business credit reporting agencies. Let's say I pay Chase. Let's say Chase reports my credit card payment to the, the two Dunn and Bradstreet. Okay, let's say so does Bank of America and Wells Fargo. Now, what the financial stress score is, is they are looking at the number of satisfactory accounts. How many accounts I paid like I'm supposed to and overall divided in the total number of payment experiences I have. How many total people do I have that I'm paying on my credit report? And how many of those am I paying as I'm supposed to? That's going to calculate into my score. A high proportion of past due balances. When I've got a bunch of accounts, that and a high amount of past due accounts. They, uh, this is called DBT when we look at business credit reports or called days beyond terms. As a matter of fact, I'm going to maybe possibly throw up one of these credit reports here. I think it might make sense to actually look at one if I can pull this off and actually show you what I'm talking about here. So what we're looking at here is a high proportion of past due balances, basically your, your past due. And when we look at this, we actually look at, um, let me see. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get here or not, but I'm going to take a look. So we also are looking at basically the number of accounts that you are past due on currently in relation to overall. This is called days beyond terms. You'll see it on a credit report listed as DBT. And even when you're one day late, you are beyond terms. Then it's like, are you one to 10 days late? Are you 30 days late? Are you 45 days late? Are you 90? Are you 120? That will determine basically your financial stress score. How many of these accounts you're behind on on the terms? UCC filings reported. This is when lenders notify DMB that you have an outstanding loan. Okay, that's exactly how that's going to work. That is going to be a UCC filing. Okay, and then on top of that, we're also taking into account high number of inquiries to DMB over the last 12 months. So if we look at uh, how many times you're actually counted late over the next 12, last 12 months, that is going to be calculated into the financial stress score as well. By the way, this is, uh, or, or actually increase the number of people inquiring into DMB over the last 12 months. And this score compares a company to similar businesses in the DMB database, and especially in your industry. That's what we're looking at. So again, we're looking at how, many, how do you pay your bills? Do you pay your bills on time or do you not pay your bills on time? Okay, that's actually what we're looking for here. And then based on that, it's going to determine the financial stress score. Then they're going to put that financial stress score in a percentile and compare you against other people in your industry. Now, the next score is called the SIR rating or the Supplier Evaluation Risk Rating. It's a scale of one to nine. One means a company is least likely to fail. Nine uh, to pay its own suppliers. Nine is the opposite. shows high likelihood. Okay. Uh, to fail and pay subscribers. So again, this or pay or to pay suppliers. So again, this is basically, are you likely to pay suppliers that give you the supplies or are you not? If a supplier is going to send you supplies, they're going to want to look at your credit report to see if you're credit worthy and whether or not they should or they shouldn't actually do this. And if you're not, well, then that's exactly what uh, is going to give you a low score. And then that's why it's going to be harder to get money or get what you need from suppliers. So factors affecting this rating, negative net worth. Again, now we look at the financial information. This comes from your tax returns. If you don't supply that, then now again, they're replacing this factor with number of employees you have in industry classification. Also, it takes into account portion of slow payment experiences to total number of payment experiences reported. And business belongs to an industry with above average risk. Guys, as you're seeing here, there's a reason that I did that whole NAICS code and I showed you how that worked. Because you see how all of these scores are comparing where you are in your industry. It's a huge problem. And so what happens here is if you don't come in and get your industry right, 
then what happens is ultimately you're being gauged against other people in your industry. And as a result of that, you're basically being assessed against people that are in an industry that you're probably not even in. And then the problem is, is that you actually can have way lower scores than what you should with all of these scores because they're looking at your industry as something that you're not even in and they're judging you based on that, okay? And I've been looking left here because I just pulled up an example. So this is exactly what I'm talking about. I'm looking at Pixar's credit report, Pixar, you know, they make Toy Story. Okay, anybody has kids loves, has seen that movie a thousand times. I know I have. Okay, so here is DMB's report from Paydex. I can show you this because it's public information. Anybody can get this, the same as anybody can get your commercial credit report. And when we come to an overview here, let me see if I can get an overview and see if they show NAICS codes here. Am I not oh, business information? We're going to come to business information here and see, you see what I'm saying? Look, this is multiple NAICS codes. This is normal SIC codes. SIC codes are the older ones we used to use. NAICS codes are the newer ones. We see here, Pixar has multiple NAICS codes. Now, in all fairness, theirs are fairly accurate here. Motion picture and video production, okay, software publishers, custom computer programming services, they may actually categorize in all of these. But with the reason that they have three, I promise you, or two, is not a three, is not because Pixar is telling people they're in different industries when they apply, okay? It's because errors have been made and Pixar didn't hire us. They should have, because we would have cleaned this up for Pixar. So the realistically, this is exactly what I'm trying to help you prevent. Pixar is being associated with multiple industries because they're not keeping an eye on their credit report, making sure that they're only assessed with one. And if Pixar went to DMB and said, we are a motion picture and video production company, NAICS 512-110, you have us listed as software publisher and custom computer programming, which we are not, remove those indicators from our credit report, DMB would do so and Pixar would only be looking at 512 110 motion picture and video production. This is exactly what it looks like when this goes wrong. And I see credit reports with 10 NAICS codes on them because people didn't follow this advice. Okay. It's exactly why I'm telling you this because as you're seeing here, these industries are extremely important to what industry you choose is extremely important. So it's very important that you get the right industry so you're not being assessed as higher risk than what you really are. Okay, now maximum credit recommendations on your credit report as well. It includes recommended dollar guidelines of how much money they recommend you should be lent. DMB performs an overall assessment of a business over the next 12 months. They also check the predicted risk of business and discontinuation. And furthermore, they look at the predicted risk of severely delinquency present payments. A lot of things here. Let's unpack it. 12 months, very important. Commercial credit scores are calculated over your risk of going late over the next 12 months. Consumer scores depict your risk of going late, 90 days late, over the next 24 months. What this means is that business credit scores are way more forgiving. You can mess this up and you can recover faster with business credit scores than you can consumer because they're just looking at your likelihood of defaulting over 12 months. Consumers looks 12 twice as long. We also see the predicted risk so we're seeing that how much money they recommend to lenders and credit issuers that you be given is based on the, how much risk they predict you have. We just looked at their predictive scores. So now you know the predictive scores they're using to determine how much money you should actually be given. That's how they come up with that calculation. If you want to know how much the credit recommendation, how it's calculated, now you know. That's exactly how they're calculated on your credit report. Okay, DMB bases its dollar guideline amounts on historical analysis. That's performance of your and your overall business risk. Business risk associated with industry risk. A recommended limit is based on the probability of severe delinquency, but this recommendation is no guarantee. Severe delinquency is classified as over 90 days late. Bottom line, they're trying to determine how likely you are to go 90 days late in the future over the next year. And if you're likely, you're not going to be recommended for a lot of money. But if you're not likely to go late over the next 90 days, you're going to be recommended for more money. This is very important. I just gave you the tip that will get you a high recommendation of credit on your DMB report, which will automatically increase the amount of approvals you're given on loans and credit lines. Nobody's ever done that in your life. Just did it. So just by following and understanding this one concept, 
you can now control the maximum credit recommendation on your report and your loan amounts will go up and your credit card limits will go up and your credit line limits will go up because now you know what they're using to actually determine how much money they're recommending. And if you don't think lenders and credit issuers look at this, you should look at your credit reports. There's a reason that the maximum recommendation of credit is one of the top things on your credit report. It's because it's one of the biggest things that lenders and credit issuers looks at, just so you know that. So DMB business information reports, okay? In addition to scores, they have all kinds of things. How many payments are, all, all of your payments are on there. The trade line specifics, dollar amounts, terms. You will not see a, a limit. You will see the recent amount of money you usually used or recently used on that account. Very important. When you look at a business credit report, then we don't actually see on these business credit reports what our limits are. What we see on these credit reports is we see how much money is actually recently being used. Here, I'll show you. Here is Pixar's credit report. High credit is not their limit. High credit is the amount of money they recently used. Okay, it's so when you see a credit report, this is not your limit. This is amount, a matter of how much you recently used. DMB is telling you how important that is to not just get credit that reports, but use that credit that reports because how much of it you're using is going to determine how high future approvals are. Okay, you also need to look at this. Check this out. They don't even list the name of the credit issuer on credit reports. Sometimes you'll see it categorized, office supplies, but you'll never see the name. I'm not saying never. Currently, you don't see the name. They're talking about changing this because there's so many issues. But currently, you won't see the name of the creditor. You're just going to actually see this or you will see a category that they're in. So some things, important notes there as well. Okay, company events. Uh, ownership changes, legal events, lawsuits, for example, company family trees showing ownership specifics. This is very important because if you buy a shelf corporation, this is what happens. It the, 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 the family tree, the company events shows that an ownership change took place. Somebody bought the business. Then lenders and credit issuers see that on your DMB report and then they automatically look at your open date as when you open your bank account, not when your business open. This is why you never want to buy shelf corporations because company events are in the information section of your DMB report. If you sell, if you buy the company from a shelf corporation company, that updates in the event section, that throws up a red flag. Any lenders and credit issuers that didn't see that will now ask for bank statements because they look at your bank account open date as your founded date. No longer will they then look at your industry, at your company founded date, which means if you bought a shelf corporation to try to fool the bureaus to be able to get more business credit, you just lost out on all the money you spent because they automatically re-age the credit report when an ownership change happens. Now, a business information report also contains a risk assessment summary. The summary shows the maximum credit recommendation you should be given. We just talked about that. The paid X score, the delinquency predictor percentile, all things we've talked about, Stre financial stress percentile, supplier evaluation risk. All of that is in that risk assessment summary. The most important score, the paid X, then where you compare in your industry, the next two scores, delinquency predictor and financial stress and supplier evaluation risk. And financial stress percentile is basically in the financial stress score, the picture risk of going bankrupt, of completely going out of business. That's what that actually looks like. That's actually what that calculates. So your business credit reports are not always perfect, obviously. Every major CRA has issues. CRA stands for credit reporting agency. So you want to go ahead and monitor your credit. If you have updates, then you want to go through DMB's dashboard. They used to call it iUpdate. They changed the name now to a dashboard. You've got to get with DMB and go through their dashboard system to update information. If you're working with us as a client already, we help you with that. Just notify our team and we'll help you fix anything on your credit report that needs to be fixed. Okay, so you want to get your reports from DMB here, dnb.com, and you can go to, the, to, to just search reports there and they'll be able to give you information on how to do that update the relevant information, like having multiple NAICS codes. And you can then do that. At I update. I don't know. This link will forward somewhere else now. But the last time I checked, you could still go to iUpdate.dnb.com and it'll direct you to the new place. But DMB, I update no longer exists with DMB. Disputing credit report errors normally means you mail something to them. If you're going directly to the credit issuer, receipts, cancel checks, stuff like that. Look, here's how we dispute. 
We just go right to the Bureau and say this information is inaccurate. And here's why it's inaccurate. And nine out of 10 times, they just remove the information. I mean, you know, there is no formal credit repair process for commercial credit because the Fair Credit Reporting Act that governs credit repair in the consumer world doesn't apply to the commercial world. The FCRA doesn't apply to the commercial world. So credit bureaus in the business space are not regulated by the same regulation that they are in the consumer space. So as a result, there's no formal process for credit repair. Not a lot of disputes happen. And what I've found, and I, I'm not even going to say in almost every case, in every case, I've seen that when we dispute something to the bureaus, they correct it and update it. The only time that didn't happen was when we went with an NEICS code to Experian and we said, you have it wrong. Here's a right NEICS code. And they said, sorry, we get that information from a third party provider. And we responded and said, yeah, we know who your third party uh, re reporting is. It's LexisNexis. Here's their report showing they have it right. Here's DMB's report showing they have it right. Here's Equifax's report showing they have it right. Here's our tax return showing the IRS has it right. Why do you have it wrong? And <laughs> immediately they fixed it. So very rarely do you have to supply proof to them. But in that example, we supplied proof and said, we know who you get your data from. You get it from LexisNexis. Here's them showing they have it correct. Why do they have it right and why do you have it wrong? Once we actually identified to them, we know where you get your information and here's them and they have it right, you have it wrong, fix it. Then they immediately fixed it. So sometimes you need to supply proof of that. Uh, but in most cases, you just don't have to. Okay, fixing your credit report means uh, you might need to specifically spell out what's wrong. And again, you can go through all kinds of things. But I found if you just dispute directly with DMB, it fixes it. If not, you can get their customer service on the phone. If not, you can actually mail them a dispute in writing. You can mail it to the credit issuer itself as well. But I've never seen those steps be needed. Just what disputing with them directly uh, typically is going to fix your problem. So DMB collects objective data points on businesses, creates business information reports. These reports have five basic scores. Some are predictive, some are performance, and they're based on the information that DMB gets financial statements they get amongst many other things. And it's in your best interest to get your DMB reports and monitor them. Look, DMB Equifax and Experian reports cost $249 a month. If you go to creditsuite.com forward slash monitoring, it's $24 a month. I am not trying to sell you $24 a month credit monitoring. I'm telling you this because it's so important that you monitor your business credit that that's why we worked with NAV to create the lowest priced product that's out there. NAV gave us a wholesale rate. We didn't mark up the price. We kept the price even lower than NAV did. And NAV let us do that because they're awesome. But we did that because we need to make sure it's affordable for you to monitor your business credit. You should have that ability. So it's only $24 a month instead of $249. It's worth it. It just helps you keep an eye on your credit scores. So hopefully you got a lot of information. If you did help me out, give me a like on the video. Just like the video, please. Throw in a comment. Tell me you liked it. That helps the algorithm show it to more people. Uh, and if you're watching on a platform like YouTube where you can subscribe, subscribe. But if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe and click the bell beside the subscribe button. Click all. That way you'll get notified whenever we release new content. I appreciate that. A lot goes into preparing this and making sure that you're informed. And all I ever ask for in return is if it provided value, please share it. Please like it. Please engage. It's just like it's a fair it's a fair trade-off, right? If you could do that, that really helps us. If you got value here, check out the top right of our website, creditsuite.com. We have daily tips on our LinkedIn, on our Instagram, on our Twitter. And then we go live on Instagram, Twitter, and Periscope, and YouTube. And uh, No, wait, excuse me. Facebook, YouTube, Periscope, and LinkedIn, we go live on uh, Tuesday and Thursday at 1, 11 o'clock Eastern. The week ahead or the week before, we schedule them out so you can come in, like it, and actually get notified when we go live as well. Make sure you check it out. Check out our podcast, The Business Credit Financing Show. You can listen as you go. Give us a call for a free consultation. We will get your business credit reports for you for free if you call us. We will go over the reports with you. We will give you tips and tactics to improve your business credit. We will do a fundability report from the secret sources that the credit bureaus get their information from. We actually are the only ones in existence that actually take the information from the sources they get it from and create it into a public report for you to have at zero dollar cost. And then we also determine all the funding you can get approved for. All of that happens on a consultation call. If you look at our reviews, you'll see things like, that's the best call I've ever had in my life. That's what happens when you get on the phone. And our number is 877-600-2487. Uh, and Kasika, which is an awesome 
uh, 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 name, by the way, says a great info from Facebook. And I appreciate that very much. And Asia says, so can, I can get rid of nav and use yours. You can, but just use nav. If you're with nav already, then ours is on the same platform. So just use nav if you already have them already. And you know, it's a little bit cheaper to work with us, but not enough to work on changing. So I'd stay with them if you're with them now. Dale says, great job. Thank you. Avilo says, awesome info. Thanks for tuning on LinkedIn and great information. Uh, J Jaco, Jacobus, thank you very much for YouTube. Thanks everybody for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Make sure you like and subscribe and I will see you soon. Um, if you watch us live tomorrow, we'll be talking about more cool ways to get money for your business. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Have a great day.